Good morning. Welcome once again to Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glenny. We're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. You're all welcome to come join us. Uh, the information is at the website, portlandbiblechurch.com. You can check it out. Also, we have live streaming on Judy Glenny, that's my wife, Judy Glenny's Facebook page. And after the service, we post it on YouTube. For that, you can go to the website at the homepage. It has services, and there's a drop-down menu, and it links you there to YouTube. We have over two, almost two and a half years, I guess, of classes, so some four or five hundred classes on there available. So far, they're still there. They haven't taken them down. So praise the Lord that we have these venues that we can get the word of God out to all who will listen. Uh, thank you so much, those who are listening from afar. Pastor Bamuleka over there in uh, Uganda and uh, uh, the church over in Iowa, the uh, Faith Baptist Church there, and also Atlanta Christian Church. So we got a lot of pastors and uh, friends that are out in various places, some new folks that I just talked to in Houston. Good morning to you. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today for Bible study. As you know, we're doing, of course, on Sunday at 10 and 11, 15, consecutive teaching in the book of Hebrews currently in chapter 11, that great faith chapter. And so we thank you so much for being a part of our Sunday morning worship. We also sing the great hymns of the church for about a half hour or so uh, after our second service. So if you want to join us for fellowship and a little bit of uh, food that we have, uh, come and join us for Sunday morning. Thursday, we have class at seven o'clock and we're doing there the study of Ephesians. I just discovered that uh, Pastor Robbie Dean down at West Houston Bible Church is also teaching Ephesians. So uh, we've got the and people who listen to Robbie and uh, Andy Woods, who's the uh, CEO, I guess, or what do you call it, I guess the dean of Chafer Seminary down in uh, uh, Albuquerque, uh, but they have the conference at the West Houston Bible Church. So uh, they listen to Andy and me and sometimes other people. All of us are going the same direction. We teach the same word of God inerrantly. And so it's just uh, an opportunity. I like to get to these conferences and fellowship with my colleagues. And so appreciate those who tune in from time to time. Thank you so much for that. Uh, don't forget to uh, check out the uh, program. We mentioned the Rosenberg Report on Thursday night. Uh, Joel Rosenberg dealing with uh, things, all things Israel and how the U.S. impacts Israel, how the other nations impact Israel. And so if you want anything that is uh, accurate from the standpoint of our own day, uh, we get uh, that uh, from Joel. He does a marvelous job. And, of course, uh, we want to know what the Word of God says with regard to ancient times and future times. So we have all that information and what's going on currently right now. So hopefully you'll tune in to him, listen to what he has to say, get you some good information. We have a lot of missionaries. Moses Amabiko just called me this week, had a chance to visit with him, and he's going to be over in the Middle East in December. Uh, he's in Nigeria this month for a Bible conference with pastors, so we pray for him and the ministry that God has given to him. It is, a, it is our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each of our classes for silent prayer. We believe this is essential so that we can make sure we have no unconfessed sin in our life. Every member of the church, every member of the body of Christ has the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We also have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit. We never lose the indwelling, but the filling or enabling is apparently uh, lost when we commit a sin. So that's why we take time to confess those sins. We find the passages that deal with this all through the Bible. The one we refer to most often deals with the dispensation of the church. And John in his first epistle says, if we confess our sins, that is name them, cite them, agree with God that their sins he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Of course, they've been judged at the cross and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that picks up the ones that we uh, confess as well as the ones that we've forgotten or didn't know about. So in preparation then for our study this morning, let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the fact that we still have freedom in this country where we can assemble together to study your word in the way that you instruct us to do. 
We thank you for your word that lives and abides forever. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has provided our magnificent salvation. We thank you for the word which allows us to understand who and what you are and the totality of your plan for us. Now, as we study this morning, we pray that you would encourage, challenge, and motivate us by the passages that we have before us. We pray it all in the powerful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approach. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this morning to the epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. Hebrews 11 verse 8. We've been looking after we had the introduction in chapter 11, verse 1, and dealing with the concept of faithful people being approved in 2 and 3. We now have examples from verse 4 of chapter 11 all the way through the end. We noted that there are some 20 individuals mentioned by name, plus quite a few others that are simply suggested, and, and the prophets as well, who uh, for the most part are not mentioned here. But the ones that are, we find scripture indicating, as we have noted in the past when we looked at the concept of the leadership uh, principles. And so we looked at many of these then. So this is kind of a restatement or a recapping as we go through these passages in the epistle to the Hebrews. But uh, that doesn't seem to bother me because we need to review these constantly because our memory seems to fail us from time to time. And that's why Paul says, let me bring these things to your remembrance because maybe you've forgotten. And so all the writers of the Testament, of the New Testament, always suggest that we should have a review from time to time. And that's what we do. The most important thing we believe for Christians, once they've accepted Jesus Christ, is to study the Word of God. Probably the second most important is to pray. The Word of God, of course, is His means of speaking and communicating to us. Prayer is our means of communicating and asking Him to take care of the needs that we have in this life and for all those things that uh, we're concerned about. So we have prayer, we have the Word of God, and so we look at it verse by verse. We use the original languages here uh, in the New Testament. That's the Koine Greek in the Old Testament, Hebrew, and some sections in Aramaic. I believe it's essential that a pastor teacher understands these languages and the grammatical constructions because that's the only way that we can get the final understanding of the inspired Word of God. And so that's how we do it. So from time to time, we use some Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic words, and we make no apology for that because it's not to show that I know those languages. By the way, I've told people, you want to learn Greek and Hebrew? I can teach you Greek and Hebrew if you want to sit through it. It's an academic study. And so, uh, but the point is that God chose those languages to, under inspiration, give us his teaching and his principles. And therefore, it's important that we understand uh, many things, of course, are clear and obvious in the English, but some things, as Peter said of Paul, are difficult to understand. And you need to go to the Apostle Paul and uh, read his writings because he really was a smart guy. And so we defer to the great Apostle Paul and his teaching. By the way, we don't want to underestimate the teacher that wrote the book of Hebrews. Some think it was Paul, but I think otherwise. I know know in one commentary they suggested probably 15 candidates and so uh, but he's just a marvelous teacher I think perhaps Apollos would fit the bill but uh, we don't know for sure it's the only New Testament epistle really that has uh, no author signified within the text it's written to the Hebrew Christians those Hebrew people who've accepted Jesus as their Messiah and to warn them against falling back into keeping the law as a means of being saved 
or of maintaining salvation, much like Paul teaches in Galatians and Romans and elsewhere in his epistles. At any rate, we've come to the great chapter of faith. Uh, we're down here to Abraham, and uh, Abraham, <clears throat> it says, faith of Abraham and Sarah. Perhaps I should have listed Sarah separately, and so uh, she does have a category, one of several women that are mentioned in this uh, epistle, in this chapter, and so Sarah is also mentioned here, so we'll cover both of those in these verses from 13 to 16. It's interesting when we get to verse 17 uh, through 19. Is it 17 through 19? No. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I got eight. Yeah. So within that period, actually verses 13 through 16, we have a parenthetical section. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And there it talks about the uh, kind of a commentary on his own writing. So the writer of Hebrews does these first verses down through 12, and then 13 to 16, he gives a commentary. It's kind of nice when the writer of Scripture actually comments on his own teaching under inspiration. At any rate, we start here with verse 8, and we began previously. And in verse 8, of course, it says, by faith. We have here <clears throat> the instrumental of means in the Greek language, which means by means of faith. Faith is the means whereby we please God. In fact, we've already noted uh, in verse 6 that without faith, <coughs> pardon me, it's impossible to please God. So each of these sections deals with faith. In this case, it's the faith of Abraham. Abraham, of course, has uh, two names. His original name, as you remember, was Avram. Uh, in the Hebrew, which meant uh, the father of the high place or high places. And in the uh, society that he came from, they worshiped on the high places, pagan deities. But God called him out of that. And subsequent, as he was called into a land that he didn't know where he was going, but God said, go, and he went. <clears throat> kind of a good commentary for us as well. That sometimes God leads us and we don't know where we're going, but we just trust the Lord to take us there. At any rate, uh, he became a believer. And of course, his name was then changed to Avraham or Abraham, as we would call it in the transliteration. Uh, Abraham, of course, uh, is the father of many nations. So he went from being the father of a pagan high place to being the father of many nations. And God said, that you will bless all the nations of the world from your time on. What a marvelous thing. So even the Hebrew people who reject uh, Jesus Christ as their Messiah recognize Abraham as the truly great Old Testament hero because uh, even the uh, people who are of the uh, Arab uh, people group, they recognize Abraham as their father as well. So Abraham is truly one of the greats of the Old Testament. And we noted last time that uh, in the Old Testament from Genesis 11 through 25, nearly 14 chapters of Genesis, almost uh, 30%, 20, 28 or percent, if you can make a percentage of the verses in Genesis deal with Abraham. And so Genesis 11, 27 to Genesis 25, 18. We mentioned this last time, but I wanted to repeat and pick this up as we went on. His life, of course, spans from 1996, that's B.C., to 1821 B.C. He was uh, one of the last of the patriarchs to have extended life. He lived 175 years. Of course, after the flood, the lifespan was reduced considerably. Before the flood, they lived up to eight, 900 years. After the flood, of course, it was reduced down eventually to three score and 10 to 80. Oh my, I'm nearly 80 now. Well, anyway, uh, 80 is the kind of mean, so hopefully I'm... Uh, I'm right in the middle and I can stretch it a little bit before the Lord comes, but be that as it may. And so 175 years, and when he was 75 years old, he got this covenant, basically, and this is when uh, uh, he was in the uh, place in Genesis chapter 12 and 15, where it speaks about the fact that he got this covenant with God. Had three aspects to it. It had the aspect of uh, many nations, also blessing all the nations of the world, obviously. And so we have that, and that he would be the father of, uh, of a great people. We know the Hebrew people come out of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and the kings would come forth from him, many kings. But ultimately, King Jesus Christ would come through this line all the way back from Abraham. And in addition to that, there's the land. 
So there's part of this parcel, if you will, or this package, this covenant that God made with Abraham that has a land portion. We have noted that that land in the kingdom in the future actually extends from the Mediterranean Sea north to Hamath all the way down to the river of Egypt and going east uh, all the way to the Tigris Euphrates. That's a land mass of about 175 to almost 200,000 square miles. All of that all of that land is going to be the inheritance as far as the land grant to Abraham and his descendants in the future. So some would suggest Israel has no future, and I would suggest that they have just thrown Abraham, as they say, under the bus, because Abraham promised great numbers of nations and people, a great nation, which is, of course, later called Israel, and uh, the kings, as well as King Jesus, and the land mass, all of those part of the Abrahamic covenant. No, so no small thing that he received. By the way, in that connection, uh, when he was uh, getting these covenants and he got the covenants, uh, let's see if I wrote those down. I think I did somewhere. At any rate, he got those uh, covenants when he went from Ur of the Chaldees. And that means that all that land is going to be Israel in the future. So those who say Israel should be destroyed or we shouldn't consider Israel today, even though many in Israel are in unbelief, of course, they could say that about the United States too, but there are many, many thousands of Hebrew people who've come to faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And so uh, looking forward to the future then, we see that there is definitely a future for the Hebrew people. And Romans, uh, uh, Paul spells that out in Romans chapter 11 in detail if you want to go and see what the New Testament says about the Hebrew people. In fact, Paul says, God hasn't forgotten Israel, uh, the Hebrew people has he? May it never be. And yet some people in the church today have discarded Israel. Uh, we call that the uh, replacement theology, uh, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. It has not. We do not teach replacement theology. Israel has a future, and even in unbelief, and of course, Israel's been in belief and unbelief through the centuries from the time of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they continue to be right up until the Lord returns. And just before he returns, all Israel, Paul tells us in chapter 11 of Romans, will be saved. That means saved, born again, saved, delivered. And these people will go into the kingdom and that land that was promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. So we have his lifespan. He was also called the friend of God. We noted that previously. Second Chronicles 20 verse 7, Isaiah 41 8, and James chapter 2 23 all express the fact that Abraham was the friend of God. One of the things that God wants for us is that we would be his friend. Uh, not just that we're born again and that we're saved, but that we become a friend of God. And how we become a friend of God is the daily application of his word and our obedience to it. And then, of course, we have the passages in Hebrews. We have uh, seven passages, uh, Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. And then uh, it skips down to verse 12. And then it picks it up again after the parenthetical section of commentary in 17 through 19. So Hebrews 11, 8, <clears throat> uh, 8 through 10 and then verse 12, and then again 17 through 19. So we have seven verses. It's interesting that God gives seven verses to Abraham in Hebrews 11. He also gives seven verses to Moses. Moses is spoken of in Hebrews 11, 23 uh, through 29. And so uh, we'll see that uh, when we get there a little bit later, 23 through 29. So uh, we have these verses, and I wanted to note something as I was studying this week. I noted that over in Acts... Uh, if we can go over there just for a moment to the book of Acts, chapter 7. Now, in the book of Acts, we have the early church, and we have testimonies by Peter, we have testimonies by Paul, uh, various testimonies. And here's one that I just noticed, and this is the one by uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, I guess, yeah, well, he's not an apostle, but a disciple, if you will, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, 1 through 8. And this is his testimony. It's a defense. You'll remember Stephen was stoned to death, but we have these great testimonies. And if people would even just read these testimonies, they go back and uh, explain going all the way back to Abraham, uh, all the things that were done in faith 
uh, so that they can give a testimony. So perhaps it's a little overkill for us when we give a testimony. We tell people they need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for their sins. If they believe that, they have everlasting life. However, uh, for the Hebrew people, they needed a little more information because they needed to recognize that Messiah, Jesus, came as a result of all of these centuries from Abraham. And so the uh, Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, and Stephen here all go through and explain the history uh, up to their time. So if we want to take a look at Acts chapter 7, we'll just read those first seven verses if you want to go along with me. We're not going to have much commentary. I just want to show you because you can read the book of Acts at your leisure and you'll see these various times where Paul and Peter and here Stephen give a testimony uh, to the authorities, to the people around. And so this is one example and this is when he's uh, before the council, and they have put forth false witnesses. And, of course, uh, uh, it says the high priest said, are these, uh, are these things so? And he, that is Stephen, says, chapter 7 of Acts, verse 1, Hear now me, brethren and fathers. He's talking to Hebrews and fathers. Uh, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Notice he doesn't go back to Adam. He starts with Abraham because Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people, basically. Uh, Moses was the father of the uh, nation of Israel, but Abraham was the father of the Hebrew people, basically. In fact, the word Hebrew, many believe, comes from the Hebrew word avar, like to go over or to cross over. Avra, Avra in the Hebrew uh, would be like Avraham or uh, Aver, meaning over. So uh, we see this one in particular. When he was in Mesopotamia, because he lived in Haran, and he said to him, depart from your country and your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Here he quotes, of course, the Old Testament in chapter 11 of Genesis and chapter 12. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans. This is the area which is uh, Persia, modern day. Iran, and this is the area that he came from, Ur of the Chaldees in Haran, uh, and of course Haran was where he went uh, after he left Ur of the Chaldees. And from there, after his father died, he removed him to the country in which you are now living, obviously to Jerusalem. Uh, he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, yet even when he had no child, he promised that he would uh, give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him. And so at that time, he really didn't have any land. Others had the land, but he's given that land later as a part of his inheritance. But God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be aliens and far, uh, in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and be mistreated for 400 years. This is prophetic in the Old Testament, dealing with the time that the Israelites were in the uh, Egyptian captivity under the pharaohs. And the people argue about the 400 years, but uh, depending on where we start to count, we get 400 or 430. They were in the land, but they were enslaved only for the 400. At any rate, <clears throat> whatever nation to which they shall be in bondage, I myself will judge. So those who have captivated uh, or captured Israel and Hebrew people, those nations will be judged. And of course, uh, obviously Babylon fell uh, because of the fact that they had enslaved the Hebrew people. The Nazis in modern time, of course, enslaving the Hebrew people. And uh, for all intents and purposes, there are no Nazis anymore, although some would argue they are, but they're undercover usually. And God, after uh, after uh, that they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Then he goes on about the patriarchs, uh, but he's not done. He goes all the way through and discusses uh, uh, Moses and Egypt and all of these things. So he continues his testimony. It's interesting. I don't know if he could even get away with that. Somebody would say, I object, I object. He's, he's rambling on and so forth. But apparently he got to say all of these things. So the testimony is in the record. <laughs> we have 
have the record right here. So we have the fact that uh, he, as well as Peter and Paul, uh, remember all the way back to Abraham, and in their testimonies, they recognize these great saints of antiquity. And so we have that. And then we see again these passages that deal with the land. And uh, I've got a couple here. We got the land was given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Let's see, I think I've got that a little bit later, so we'll pick that up and give you those passages. But basically, the Abrahamic promise uh, when he was 75 in the land of Israel, uh, and uh, this is found in Genesis 12. So just hold the place and then go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, verse 7. We won't look at all of it. We have studied this under the Abrahamic covenant in the past, and we have some notes here on the table of the covenants, and so uh, you can take a look at that if you're here, or you can go online, the study of the doctrine of the covenants. And so in Genesis 12, if I can get there, Genesis 12, those first few verses you'll see, we have, uh, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, before his name was changed, Go forth from the land, uh, from your relatives and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. Notice. And the one who curses you, I will also curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the Abrahamic covenant is primarily to Israel. However, it is also to all the nations. And so if we go there and go down then to verse 7, we see it says, And the Lord appeared basically a second time to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built in there an altar to the Lord uh, who had appeared to him. This is a theophany, what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have that. And then the restatement of the actual landmass is found in Genesis 15. So the two important chapters, although he mentions it elsewhere, that is God does in the Genesis text and elsewhere in scripture, obviously in our passage as well. But in Genesis 15, 18, and following down through the end of the chapter in Genesis 15, 18, here we see the covenant being established in uh, his old age and so forth. And uh, then he is told in verse 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was uh, very dark and behold, a smoking oven, if that's the way it's described, and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. The pieces were laid out by Abram uh, in terms of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant as we understand it, and therefore God was ratifying that covenant with Abraham. But here we notice the land grant portion uh, in verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. Now, not just this land, Israel, as we know it today, or just Jerusalem and the surrounding area, but he says, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt. That's right where the Mediterranean kind of curves up. Uh, uh, at the uh, west, at the east end, and uh, right there at that crack there, we got the river of Egypt, right? Not the Nile, the river of Egypt is further to the east. The river of Egypt, from that point, he says, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, that goes all the way to the Euphrates River. So those people who reject Israel as having a future, they are saying Abraham was, God lied to Abraham, because he said, you're going to have all that land from the river of Egypt all the way to the Euphrates River, and then he names all the people that are going to be dispossessed, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim. Uh, the Rephaim, of course, they were the giants, you'll remember. Uh, Goliath was one of the Rephaim. He was of the father Rapha and his father, great-grandfather, Enoch. And so those were the giants. And the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. And so basically they were going to be dispossessed. But we see all that land going from the river of Egypt right at the corner where the Mediterranean swings forth, uh, goes north, all the way over to the Euphrates River. We said about 180 to uh, 200,000 square miles of land 
all will be Israel's land in the future. Right now they're fighting over West Bank and portions of, in Gaza and so forth. <laughs> Believe me, in the future they're going to have it all, everything, all the way to the Euphrates. So those people who want to reject Israel in their future uh, are totally missing the scripture and negating what God promised to Abraham. By the way, uh, this promise was given 3,943 years ago. Almost 4,000 years ago, this promise has been given, and God will keep it. We're 2022, and going all the way back, we have 3,943 years from the time the covenant was made with Abraham for the land that he would possess, for the people, for the generations of uh, nations that would come, as well as King Jesus. Of course, it was later fleshed out in uh, several other covenants. We do have those here, if you're interested. Uh, we have... Uh, a chart. I have it here. Let me get it up. This is, uh, I'll, I'll hold it up. We have some here on the table if you haven't seen these. And this basically uh, is a chart. I think this is put out by Dr. Tommy Ice. And so this talks about the covenants of Israel. And so you can go to the website under our charts and graphs and you can take a look at this. It has the various covenants. You can see there the Abrahamic covenant is the main root, if you will, of everything in the future for Israel. And so we have that. And then coming out of that, we have separate covenants. We have the Davidic covenant, which deals with King Jesus. That's spelled out with regard to David. It was in brief when he spoke to Abraham about kings would come forth. But then under David, the information came that King Jesus would come through the line or the Messiah would come through the line of King David. And so we have the Davidic covenant, so-called. Uh, we also have, in addition to that, uh, sometimes called the Palestinian covenant. I don't like to use that term. I don't know if they did that on here. Uh, yeah, they still use the term Palestinian, which was a slang that was used for Israel to demean them because the word Palestine comes from the word Philistine. And they were the arch enemies of Israel always. And of course, uh, today, the, the Philistines, by the way, they were uh, simply a... Uh, army for hire. They were not a particular ethnic group. They were made up of many different peoples, but they all hated Israel. Hmm. Sound familiar? At any rate, uh, we have the, the fact then that there is a uh, this covenant that, uh, that uh, the land, we sometimes now call it the land grant covenant. And then, of course, we have the new covenant. And the new covenant, pardon me, the new covenant, do I have it upside down? I think there. I used to have an overhead projector, but we don't have it right now. So you have to go to the website. You can look at this, Covenants of Israel. And so you see the new covenant also stems from the Abrahamic covenant. I love this chart because it helps to put in focus what we're talking about. Now, the new covenant is in Jeremiah 31, 31. God told Jeremiah that there would be a new covenant that would replace the Mosaic covenant. Now, the Mosaic covenant, we call the covenant of law did not come out of the Abrahamic covenant. It was put in place to include the fact that man is basically sinful and needs a savior. And so God had an entire, an entire ritual system so that they could understand uh, his plan of salvation being eventually fulfilled in the person of Christ. And so this new covenant was, was prophesied and it was basically ratified by Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. Last week we had the communion service and we commemorate the, uh, the establishment of that new covenant promised by Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31, 31. And so Jesus ratified that covenant as well as prophesying his death, burial and resurrection, and also a betrothal to his church, which would be the bride. So the communion service has great, great things that we can think of when we take those elements. At any rate, we have these covenants, and they all point to the future kingdom. You can kind of see the arrow there, if you can see this on the, on the uh, uh, Facebook there. The arrow points to the kingdom. They all point to the kingdom. Notice that the Mosaic covenant does not go to the kingdom. It ends at the cross. And this is what the whole New Testament says. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law of Moses. So now we're under the law of Christ, a new covenant. And so we share in the covenant to, 
that uh, Abraham was given, the covenant basically for Israel, but we get the overflow or blessing. Paul describes that extensively in Romans, as we noted, chapter 4, 5, and following in the book of Romans. Well, we have these passages then, and we just noted them in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 12, 7, or that whole section, particularly 7, which deals with the land, and then Genesis 15, uh, 18 through 21. So we noted those things as well. Um, okay, by faith, Abraham... Having been called, the word kaleo is the verb in Greek, which means to invite. So he invited him. I guess Abraham could have said, no way, I'm not coming. Uh, we remember Jonah did that. God said, go to Nineveh and give him the, tell, him, tell him that I'm going to destroy him. And he said, no way, I'm going, I'm going the other way. Uh, of course, God had a, a, a very circuitous journey for Jonah, which included his being uh, for a period in the belly of the great fish who later spit him out on the shore, and this time he got with it. Abraham uh, went because God told him to go. I think it's much better and much easier on us if we're obedient to do what God says uh, as best we can understand through his word and through divine guidance than to say, no way. And I very often talk to people that are Christians and they don't want to go to church. They say, well, I don't, I don't believe anymore. And I think, you know, uh, you're piling up discipline for yourself, not because of what I say, but because of what the word of God says. And then I might refer to Jonah. But of course, most people that are unbelievers or even baby believers, sometimes they don't even know who Jonah was. When I was coming up, we had Sunday school. We knew about Jonah and the great fish. We knew about Moses and the Ten Commandments. We learned those things. But today, you can talk to the average person on the street. Sadly, even some people have been in church for years, and they say, well, Moses, was that the guy with the big fish, or who was that? You know, And they, they can't get them straight. I mean, simple facts of history, even if you don't accept the Bible as the Word of God, the historic teaching of the Bible, it gives us history. And uh, much of the Old Testament is historic. We have all the books of the kings. We have history in many of the prophets, certainly in Genesis, Exodus. All of the Pentateuch deals with history off and on throughout the writings of Moses under inspiration. So obviously God has given us this information. So we are called. But do we come? Do we obey? By the way, the calling uh, is the invitation to believe. That's what they used to call in churches the altar call when they would give an invitation to believe in Jesus Christ when the gospel was given clearly in churches. They called it the what? The altar call. That's the call to believe in Christ. Calling does not mean you're saved. Calling is the invitation. It says, having been called. Perfect tense, passive voice, God does the calling, obeyed. Here's the aorist active indicative, point of time. The active voice, Abraham obeyed. He was called and he believed. He obeyed not only in believing in the God that uh, had created the universe, the God we now call the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God the Father, God who said his name was the I am that I am. He believed and he obeyed. The word for obey here in the Greek is hupakuo. Hupo is under, akuo means to hear under, and it comes to be translated then to obey, to hear under authority, we might say. If you're under authority and you hear so as to act upon that, it's called obedience. Aorist tense is the point of time when he left Ur of the Chaldee, went to Haran, and subsequently into a land that he had no idea where he was going to go, but that was the land that God would promise to him. Uh, the indicative mood, it's reality, and one of the things we see here, as well as in the testimony of Stephen and Peter and Paul and others, is the fact that the Old Testament is history. It is really true. The indicative mood is reality. He really did obey. He really was called. He really was a human being, and of course it says by going out. Now it had to have action. And a lot of people say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, but they don't want to do anything. They don't want to evangelize. They don't want to be obedient to the principles of God. There's action. You can obey and believe, but then you need to put that uh, belief and obedience into action. And his action was to go forth. We have the verb ex erkomai. In Greek, the word erkomai or the verb means to go out or to go in. And then we have ek, E-K, which means out. So clearly he went out. 
Again, it's the aorist active, in this case, infinitive, which is related back to his belief and his obedience and went out to a place, unto a place. The definite article is here, so it's a specific location, even though they don't translate it uh, in the New American Standard, but uh, it is to the place, the place that God had described to him. So as we're going through this verse, it says uh, he went to a place. It's really definite article there. I know sometimes people say, well, it reads a little better. He went to a place. Yeah, it was a place. Yeah. But it was the specific place that God had told him. The definite article in Greek is particularizing. That means it's a specific location when the article is present. When the article is not present, uh, in English, we think, well, just uh, a boy could be any boy. But in Greek, it has to do with the uh, quality of the noun rather than its uh, uh, indiscriminate nature. And so in the Greek, however, uh, the A indicates some qu quality because there's no a in the Greek. It simply has no article. When it has the article, it's a definite and specific place. So he went out to the place, the place which we have the relative pronoun, uh, which of course is talking about that place, the place that uh, he was about to receive. So it was the place he was about to receive, and here we have the imperfect tense indicating that he was in progress. So here we have the writer of Hebrews describing his journey, uh, which of course took some time, a little circuitous, and eventually got there, and uh, then he went down to Egypt, and so uh, we have all those chapters that we mentioned previously, we had uh, 14 chapters. So if you want to know, as Paul Harvey used to say, I date myself, you, the rest of the story, you can go back to uh, Genesis and you can check uh, uh, Genesis, those chapters that we already noted, the 14 chapters from uh, uh, Genesis 11:27 to 25, 8. And that's the time uh, and the teaching about Abraham. So that's the whole story. So he was about to receive the, here we have again, this idea of reception and receiving an inheritance or unto an inheritance. So the inheritance was multiple. We noted the inheritance had to do with a with great nations. First of all, a people, the Hebrew people coming out of Abraham, then later Isaac, and then Jacob. A great people, a great nation, multiple nations, kings and rulers, leaders, and a land. All of that was part of the inheritance. Uh, if you want specifics on that, uh, I'm not going to look at all of these for time's sake, but the land we already noted in Genesis 12, 1 and 7, Genesis 15, 18 to 21, you have those down already, and also in Genesis 13, 17, you might want to add that. So the land portion of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 1 and 7, 13, 17 and 15 chapter 15 18 to 21 as far as the people uh, or the people and the nations in Genesis 12 2 and 13 16 all those talk about the people and then kings coming from the Abrahamic promise Genesis 17 6 through 9 so we have land we have the people and nations we have the kings Genesis 17, 6 through 9 are the kings, the people, Genesis 12, 2, and 13, 16. So when it says inheritance, it is the entire inheritance package, trifold, land, people, and nations, and kings, royalty. And he went forth, he did it. He went forth, the aorist active indicative indicates the point of time that he left out, again we noted, and not knowing, here's an interesting thing, not knowing where he was going. <laughs> I just love this. You know, many times we get so frustrated because God seems to be leading us somewhere. We go, where am I going? I don't even know where I'm going, you know, and and, and we get all perplexed. And sometimes we, we really, we don't want to do whatever we think we should do because it, God hasn't made some specific sign. Listen, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Now, I know that we should plan for vacations, we should know where we're going, but there's a certain spontaneity about living by faith. 
and doing what God says to do and just not knowing where we're going. Many of us are in that position right now in terms of where we're living because of the difficulty uh, in the political arena in some areas of our country and around the world. We think maybe I should move somewhere else. And so uh, we're not sure about that. And yet, uh, should I move? Shouldn't I move? What should I do? How should I take care of my finances? Should I invest? Should I pull all my investments out and buy gold? And, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and I guess the answer is that Abraham went, he didn't know where he was going. He just packed up and went out and the Lord led him. Now, I'm not telling you to pack up and go out and just wander around because he had a promise and his promise that he would have a land and all these things that we've just noted. So he knew there was a, a an inheritance coming. He just didn't know where it was. And by the way, he really didn't know when it was because kings would come later. The people, of course, came through him, but eventually they would become the nation of Israel. He didn't know that. He talked about uh, he was going to have nations. He didn't know the nation of Israel because it wasn't in his uh, purview. So he didn't know how it was going to become a people. Uh, he didn't know where he was going as far as the land. Uh, all of these things, he didn't really, uh, we say, well, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Yes, uh, he believed basically that he would have a son. And that son, of course, would have many heirs, ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. So in a sense, he did have a gospel, but it was only in part, in part, and he did not have the whole picture. In retrospect, we look back and we go, yes, well, Abraham knew all about Jesus Christ. But did he? He understood there would be kings coming. And certainly I believe that just as Moses, there would be a leader that would come to Israel, a Messiah. I believe that he understood that, uh, but uh, it was partial. We look back and we have the whole picture. Yet when we look forward to the kingdom, we look forward to Jesus coming for us, uh, we don't have the whole picture. Guess what? We move by faith. We hope the Lord comes soon, but if he doesn't, he'll lead us wherever to do whatever he wants us to do. So this is a great passage. He did not know where he was going. The Greek word here is uh, epistemi, uh, epistemi uh, which means uh, epi is upon and uh, Histemi or histemi uh, means to stand. You probably remember when you get an antihistamine, anti is against, histemi means to stand. So antihistamine stands against something that you're taking the antihistamine for. And so here it's epihistemi, which means to stand upon. And then we have the negative may. He has no knowledge. He had nothing to stand upon except the promise of God. So not knowing means he didn't really know that aspect of it. He knew he'd get an inheritance. He had some idea from the passages we noted, but he didn't know where or when these things would happen. And he looked forward, even in the writer, the book of Hebrews, we're going to see, he was looking forward to a city and a homeland, even though all of his life he dwelt in tents, never got to be in the uh, palace, as it were, as later kings would be, David and others, and as the Lord Jesus Christ would establish that royal palace uh, in the new Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem, all these things. But uh, he looked forward, and he looked forward to a city not made with hands. He actually looked forward to that heavenly Jerusalem, but he never got to go there. I've always just uh, said that when we get to be with the Lord in the heavenly Jerusalem at the second advent, Abraham and all the Old Testament saints will be coming through the gate. And we'll get to salute them. Hi, Abraham. Hi. We'll be the church. We'll be the, uh, the people who greet them as they enter into the heavenly Jerusalem. What a glorious time. And yet we can't see it except by faith. But there it is. So he did not know where he was going, but God knew and promised him. Well, we'll come back in the second hour and continue on with uh, his faith and his journey to the land in verse 9. Father God, thank you again for the opportunity of studying these incredible historic facts and these passages which tell us how Abraham acted in faith once he was invited by God to be a part of this magnificent plan and was given this covenant, he fulfilled his part in that he left his home not knowing where he was going or when it would be fulfilled to do the will of God. And we thank you for his faithfulness and the indication that it gives to us that we might likewise be faithful. And Father, for that one person here this morning, without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life. We want you to know God had you in mind 
when he sent his son Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, into human history via the virgin birth called the incarnation, God in human form. He was undiminished deity. He was true humanity in one person forever. He was sinless in his life, in his humanity, qualifying him to go to the cross as the final sacrifice, fulfilling all that the Levitical sacrifices and all the sacrifices that had gone before. He was the final sacrifice as far as our salvation is concerned. And all you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvific work his death on the cross for your sins and my sins, the sins of the whole world, once and for all time. You can have everlasting life right where you sit right now. You can express it to God in a prayer, but you can simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son, his only called son, his only born son, that whosoever, anybody, put your name in there, anybody who would believe Believe, that is, accept the fact of who Jesus Christ was. Believe, would not perish in eternal lake of fire, but rather have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Won't you do it before you leave this morning? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Father, thank you. For another opportunity to study in your word, to travel the time of history into the past, into the present, and into the future as we examine our life in connection with what you have mandated for us as human beings and for us as those who are saved and members of your family. Thank you, Father. We thank you so much. And we thank your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his marvelous name that we pray. Amen.